This meeting is being recorded. Okay, this is going to be video number five. So we left off last time summarizing what we can learn from the standard Modigliani and Miller theorem. So what the theorem says is that if markets were perfect, then capital structure would not matter. But of course, what we emphasized last time is the way to read this statement is to use the its um, contrapositive version, namely, if capital structure matters, it is because capital markets, it is because uh, financial markets are secure and perfect. And said another way, it is because of the frictions that Modigliani and Miller assume away. So for instance, Modigliani and Miller assume that there are no taxes. They assume that there are no costs associated with financial distress. And they assume that information is perfect. So that for instance, shareholders ne never have to worry about um, moral hazard on the part of managers, which of course is not the case in reality. So what we're going to do with the rest of this chapter is we're going to relax those assumptions one by one and then we're going to see what happens to the Modigliani Miller theorem. So the, the first one to do of course and the most obvious one perhaps the most important one is taxes. So let's talk about um, taxes. So when you are a tax corporation what happens is that debt payments interest are tax deductible and so that means that debt independently of the asset side of the corporation creates uh, value and it's only a question of how much value and to understand how much value that creates in the context of the Modigliani and Miller environment let's just go to my notes it will be easier so that's on my web page uh, under notes let me make them bigger there we go. And let us do Modigliani Miller with taxes, which is section four in my notes. So the way to understand what uh, value uh, debt can create when there are taxes is simply to write free cash flows to the firm. And let's be careful here for once. This is rare in this class, but for once, I'm not talking about unlevered free cash flows to the firm. I'm talking about actual bona fide uh, free cash flows to the firm. That is to say the cash flows that are available, that are actually available for distribution to equity and debt holders. And we know from our chapter one that I can always write um, when depreciation is equal to investment, at least free cash flows to the firm, actual free cash flows to the firm as the sum of two things. One is uh, unlevered FCFF and then plus the debt tax shield that I get from the fact that I have debt, which here is just what I owe in interest, D times R, D times the tax rate. Now, this is a game that we've played before. What this is saying is that FCFF is something that I can write at this, as the sum of two cash flows. So I, we can play this deconstruct the chicken game of valuing each cash flow at a time. So let's look at the first cash flow here. This first cash flow is exactly what an unlevered corporation would generate. An unlevered corporation would have zero debt. So that's what they would generate. So we know how to discount that. The right discount rate for the expected value of that cash flow is going to be the uh, rate of return that investors into an unlevered corporation would demand. So if I look at this first cash flow here, this is just going to be the value of the unlevered corporation. Not surprisingly, since these are exactly the cash flows generated by the unlevered corporation. And then all that I have left to value is the um, interest tax shield. Uh, of course, you can see here that the interest tax shield is proportional to debt payments, at least to interest, which of course debt payments and interest are exactly the same in Modigliani and Miller. In life, they may be slightly different because we also have payments towards principal, but as a first approximation, we can say that the interest tax shield is more or less proportional or is going to have a similar volatility to um, our interest payments. And so if the market requires RD from those interest payments, it is natural to discount the uh, this cash flow here at the interest uh, at the rate of interest, which is what we do here. But obviously, this cash flow, which in Modigliani and Miller is assumed to be um, 
risk free. So we don't need expectations here, but even if you put expectations, you're going to get exactly the same outcome, at least approximately, like I said, divided by the discount rate RD. This is a perpetuity, something I get forever. So this is the right way to discount here. And so I get that the value of the levered corporation is the value of the unlevered corporation plus the present value of the debt tax yield, which here happens to be simply tau times d, the quantity of debt that I have. And here what we see is the version of a very, is a version of a very important principle in finance, which is the adjusted present value principle. If you want to value an investment or if you want to value a corporation, something that you can always do is value the investment first as if it was an un, as if you were making an unlevered investment. So what would be the value of my investment or here of the corporation if I had no debt? And then independently, I can measure the net present value created by the financing. So this APV princi principle, which says APV equals present value of the unlevered investment plus the NPV created by financing is completely general. And when we introduced other ways in which uh, debt is going to create or destroy for that matter some value, we will always be able to use the APV. So the APV, unlike say the WAC approach to valuation requires basically no assumptions. It is accounting. It has to be true that the value of the levered corporation is the value of the unlevered corporation plus the value created or destroyed by the fact that I'm using financing. So this is a very, very important expression. And here we're simply um, illustrating it in the context of a, um, a simple example, which is Modigliani Miller with taxes. Okay, good. So moving on. So uh, we've already here, we can already see that Modigli the basic Modigliani Miller, which says capital structure does not matter, uh, no longer holds when you introduce taxes. The value of the levered corporation is higher than the value of the unlevered corporation. And here it is higher by a number that we can compute very um, easily. So what else happened when you have taxes? So we can, we need to adjust our leverage formula with uh, taxes. So we know that the unlevered return is now going to be um, my uh, um, unlevered free cash flows to the firm divided by how much it would cost me to purchase 100% of the unlevered corporation. Um, so this is basic. So then what about the levered equity return? Well, the levered equity return is only going to be different from the unlevered equity returns in that I have to pay my debt holders. But of course, I get a tax break. So this is the net payment that I'm making to my debt um, holders, which means that I can write uh, my levered equity investment as the sum here of those two cash flows. And then a little bit of algebra, which uses this old math trick of multiplying anything I want by a one. This is just a fancy way to write the number one. But another way to write the number one is this guy. Why? Because VU is equal to VL. The value of the levered corporation by definition is D plus E, but minus the present value of the debt tax yield. So here I've written a one, here I've written a one, but that means I can take that one and multiply anything I want in the expression above by that number. And the number I'm going to multiply by this fancy one is this guy. And then you just plow through the math and you get this augmented leverage formula, which says that the leverage equity return is the unlevered return plus the impact of leverage, which looks exactly like before. This is the piece we had before, except there is a slight correction for taxes. Let me be clear here. You must go through this algebra. You must understand it just because we're not going over it in detail so that I don't bore you to tears um, in this video for a change does not mean that it's not important. You should do this. You must understand that this is the right expression. So this is what we get. This is um, leverage mechanics with taxes. We've already used it once to compute the difference between levered betas and unlevered betas. You will remember that from the previous chapter. We're not going to do this uh, again. But the key result that we need and this is something that truly, if you think about it, is surprising. 
is we need an extension of this section 6.2 here. You remember that in section 6.2 of my notes, what we proved, which because that was easy, was that WAC is the correct discount rate for unlevered FCFF when you have no taxes. So that took barely any work once we had the WAC invariance result. But now we want to do the same. We want to say that WAC is the right discount rate also for unlevered FCFF, even when there are taxes, and that's not nearly as obvious. So first, let's remember what WAC looks like um, when there are taxes. So this is an expression we've written many times and used for that matter many times in this class. When we did DCF, we used this expression. So it's just a weighted average of the expectations of all my stakeholders when we recognize that the cost of the expectations of my debt holders is has to be multiplied by one minus the tax rate because interest is tax deductible. Okay, so that's whack. And when we did DCF, what did we do? We did the standard thing of writing unlevered FCFF and discounting at one and somehow we need this to give us the right answer. So what does it mean that it's going to give us the right answer? It means that when I take my expected unlevered FCFF, which is this, this expression here, 1 minus tau times expected EBIT, and I discount that at WAC, it means that I'm getting exactly the value of the levered corporation. But what did we prove a moment ago? We said that the value of the levered corporation is the value of the unlevered corporation plus the present value of the debt tax yield. Okay, so this is what we need to show. We need to show this here. And that takes work, and it's not obvious. It's kind of magic that, uh, honestly, that uh, discounting by WAC is going to pick up exactly correctly the present value of the interest tax yield. I mean, we've verified it numerically so many times already that I know you believe it, but it's interesting to go through the algebra that Modigliani and Miller did for us in 1958, because this is not that the algebra is complicated. It's just that it's even establishing this. Uh, is not obvious. Why this should work is kind of surprising at first. Okay, so to get there, again, what's the goal? The goal is to show that uh, when we discount unlevered FCFF at WAC, we get the right answer, which is VU plus the present value of the debt tax yield. So first we need uh, an intermediate step. So this is a baby lemma. That baby lemma says that this has to be true about WAC and unlevered equity returns. It says that if you multiply the value of the levered corporation by WAC, you get exactly what you would get if you multiply the value of the unlevered corporation by uh, the required return on the un equity investment. So th this probably looks like hieroglyphs um, to you. So let me tell you in plain English what this is saying. What this is saying is that the total return on the levered corporation is the same as the total return on the unlevered corporation. Why do I say that? So VL is what it would cost me to buy basically the entire corporation, the levered corporation. If I had to, I would have to buy all the debt, I would have to buy all the equity, and I would claim all the cash flows, all the cash flows from asset. You likewise is what it costs me to buy the unlevered corporation. So the return that I get on my investment has to be the same regardless of um, uh, whether I go levered or unlevered. So the sense in which that's kind of obvious and barely requires a proof is that the asset side of the corporation is the same. What I'm going to distribute to my uh, stakeholders is the same in the end, regardless of whether I'm levered versus unlevered. So, so far so good, total return should come from the asset side mostly, but what is odd and what is kind of amazing is here in the levered corporation we just said above, I get this interest tax sheet. So how come this works? And this works because WAC captures the value of the interest tax shield exactly and exactly correctly. So this is what this this is the expression that we want. That basically the total return after tax return is the same whether you go levered or unle uh, uh, unlevered. And so this is just um, you know algebra, uh, which is quite tedious. Uh, you know, it's not exactly charming algebra, but the way you start is you actually start from WAC, and I want to show that WAC is VU times E of RU divided by VL. So WAC is the expression we 
uh, know and loved. And uh, then what I do is I take this levered equity return and I replace it by the formula that we developed above. And then I do a lot of tedious math, which again, I want you to do. It's not fun, but you you should do it once just to make sure that this is all correct. And sure enough, uh, everything nicely cancels out and you get that WAC is E of RU divided by uh, times VU divided by VL. In other words, VL times WAC is E of RU times VU. So the total return after tax is the same regardless of whether you go levered or unlevered to put it in plain English. And so why did we do this? Because once you've established this, the rest is completely obvious. So remember, we want to know what happens when we do DCF in that way that people do DCF in practice, which is write unlevered uh, FCFF discount at WAC. So all I'm going to do now is I'm going to replace WAC by the expression that we just found for WAC above and then lo and behold a little bit of work which um, here uh, the, as I go from step number one to step number two all I'm doing is I'm dividing the numerator and the denominator denominator both by E of RU and it gives me this expression uh, here and uh, but of course once I've done this what do I have in the numerator uh, this is the value of the unlevered corporation if I'm unlevered I'm going to get this by way of cash flow and that's the discount rate I'm going to apply so that's going to give me VU and so what do I have I have VU divided by VU over VL which is 1 over 1 over VL which is VL which is exactly what we wanted to show we wanted to show that when I discount unlevered FCFF by WAC, I get the right answer. And the bottom line, again, is that if you take unlevered FCFF and you discount that at WAC, you get exactly the right answer in the world of Modigliani Miller. And that's the justification for doing it in practice. OK, so this was all painful and tedious algebra. As usual, we want to believe this algebra, so we're going to verify this algebra using a numerical example. And for that, we are going to return to the example we started building last time. So this is the uh, the Excel that we did last time, which was the case with no taxes. And what I want to do now, and let me insert some space here, is I want to uh, add taxes. So I'm going to have a tax rate our good old tau and I'm going to assume that the tax is 30 percent because why not and so now I want to redo everything we did last time everything I want to redo that so I'm going to make a copy but I want to do it when I have taxes okay so first of all I want you to realize and verify that D max has not changed just because I have taxes. It's kind of funny, right? Because now I'm getting taxed and yet I'm able to sustain the same quantity of debt. Yes, I'm able to sustain the same quantity of debt. So um, this is something that you uh, want to check for yourself, that it is true that the cash flows, the worst case scenario cash flows that I have available to retire that are not affected by taxes but you go ahead and check that. All right, so now let's start uh, filling up my table. So what has changed? So what is the value of um, the corporation when I have taxes in Modigliani and Miller? Well, first, the value, we have to start from the value of the unlevered corporation, but now we have the tax rate equal to 30%. So the value of the unlevered corporation has changed. Now I have to lose some of my cash flows to the government. So the value of the corporation has gone down. And specifically, we just verified that what you want to know, uh, what, what you want to do in that case is multiply your expected EBIT by one minus the tax rate, which is over here, F4. And I'm going to multiply my expected EBIT by one minus the tax rate, and I'm going to divide that by the required return on the unlevered investment. At this point, I'm going to assume that that parameter has not changed. I mean, we are in a different world now. We are in a world with taxes, so in principle, every 
expectations could change, including the expectations from an unlevered investment because the economy has changed. But for now, uh, we're just doing this for illustration purposes. We're not solving an equilibrium model, so it's all good. We're just going to leave it uh, as is. So that's the value of the unlevered corporation. Uh, and obviously, since I have not changed the discount rate, what happens is the value of the unlevered corporation is 30% lower than it was uh, when there were no taxes. Okay, so now that I have this number, what is the value of my corporation with taxes and debt? Well, in general, we just proved this, it's going to be the value of the unlevered corporation, F4, plus the tax rate, tau F4, times my debt level. Okay, so this is just the formula we just came up with and of course now we see a big difference from the other day. The other day the value of the corporation was independent of the debt level. That was Modigliani Miller without taxes. Now with taxes that's no longer true because the more debt I have the um, more uh, the bigger of a tax shield I get, which of course invites the question of if that's so great, why don't I uh, ha always add as much debt as I want? But that's of course because we're overlooking some of the negative consequences of leverage and that will be the rest of the chapter. But for now, that is all good because it just reduces my um, taxes. So very good. So that's the value of my corporation. So this formula here should be correct because I just cut it uh, from last time and it's just using basic accounting, which is just saying that my the value of my equity is the value of the corporation minus debt. And for instance, when debt is equal to zero, everything uh, should be just fine. Now let's look at this next uh, formula and let's ask ourselves whether or not that is the right uh, return to my levered equity. So of course here the problem is I did not take into account the impact of taxes. I did pay my debt holders but I did not take into account the impact of taxes. So what I want to do is take that numerator and multiply it by 1 minus the tax rate F4 times and so this should give me the right expected return on equity so let me just make sure that I put my F4 everywhere that looks right and then I can finish my expected return to equity. Okay, good. So now we've corrected my uh, payoff to equity to reflect the fact that there are taxes. Let's see if we can correct my uh, WAC properly. So WAC is, uh, let me see what it is pointing at. So it is doing Da, 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 that times, okay, very good. And then the thing is I now have taxes and because I now have taxes, I want to get, I want to take this payment to debt and I want to multiply that by one minus the tax rate. Why? Because it is the after tax consequences of debt that matter. So all I've done as I went from what we did last time to what I did this time is the, the formula for my work has only changed insofar as the after tax cost of debt is less than the before tax cost of debt and in WAC I want the after tax cost of debt. Excellent and so uh, once here uh, I get of course uh, when I have no debt WAC exactly equal to the required return on equity. And then um, when I click, click all the way down, I get all my wax given the quantity of debt. And so what is the, um, what, what do we observe here? So last time, of course, this was Modigliani Miller proposition number two, WAC was invariant. It did not vary with debt. Now that's no longer the case. WAC goes down. Why does it go down? Because as I use more and more debt, now it is the case that my average cost of capital goes down. And we know from last time that that's not just because I'm putting more weight on uh, a source of funds which is cheaper. We know that that would be exactly offset by the impact of leverage on the payoff to equity. That's what we did last time. But now as I'm adding more debt, my uh, tax benefits go up and up and up. So this reduction here in WAC uh, 
comes from the exactly from the interest tax shield. And what happens then if I'm if I take my unlevered FCFF, unlevered FCFF are by definition independent of my debt level. And if I discount that by this ever declining whack, of course, the value of the corporation is going to go up, which is something we already verified here. Okay, so last time we wanted to make sure that our uh, leverage formula was correct. And here we have to adjust our leverage formula. So this is the leverage formula that says unlevered equity return plus D over E times uh, unlevered equity return minus the cost of debt. Uh, that should be exactly equal to my um, pay, uh, expected return on equity. You see that that's no longer true here. There is a gap between those two, and that's because we need to correct our formula just like, just like we did in my notes, and we need to multiply that by one minus the tax rate. Very good. F4. And now, of course, I should be able to check if everything works out and everything works out that our leverage formula is correct. Whether you measure the pay, the expected return on equity directly using cash flow divided by the cost of the investment or indirectly using my unlevered, my uh, leverage formula, you get exactly the same answer. Very good. Another thing that we want to check is that it is our claim that WAC is right when um, uh, when we introduce taxes in Modigliani and Miller, is that correct? So in, you remember that when I do DCF, what do I do? I look, I compute my unlevered equity return, uh, unlevered free cash flows to the firm, sorry, which is one minus the tax rate F4 times my expected EBIT. F4. So, so far, just like we did in the long DCF, I've measured uh, unlevered free cash flows to the firm. If I discount that at WAC, I'm always going to get the right answer. In other words, it is going to be the value of the corporation. But we've already, we already have one way to calculate the value of the corporation, which is the APV approach, value of the unlevered corporation plus the NPV created by financing. So we have it over here. So we need to make sure that we get the same number. Of course, we do get the same number where there is no debt. It would be shocking if anything else happened. But what is important is that we always get the right answer. So that in fact, discounting unlevered FCFF at WAC is the right thing to do in the world, is exactly the right thing to do in the world of Modigliani and Miller. Okay, very good. So here we are in this strange world of uh, Modigliani Miller plus taxes, where taxes are all good, in which case we should see corporations lever up, lever up as much as they can, which is not what we see in practice. And that's got to be because that has some nefarious consequences on the value of the corporations. It's not that you get just that you get a tax break, all kinds of things, uh, bad things are going to start happening. And we're going to discuss those bad things in detail uh, in video number six. But as a preview, let's assume that um, we're going to calculate value with bankruptcy costs. Uh, in other words, let's assume that for one thing, Having more leverage makes bankruptcy more likely. And the fact that bankruptcy becomes a positive probability when it was a 0% probability, obviously when you had no debt, that creates bad behavior on the part of managers. And also you may have to bring in lawyers and nobody wants to do that because they're extremely expensive. So let's assume that there is an offsetting factor. So in that case, we're going to use the APV, APV principle, which is, I'm going to take the value of my corporation, which is the unlevered value of the corporation. I'm going to add the value created by the interest tax yield, which we've already done. But now I want to subtract the cost of uh, making bankruptcy a positive probability event. And here I'm going to use a very special um, functional form, which is I'm just going to multiply, uh, I'm going to take minus 0 0.0005 times the quantity of debt, and I'm going to put a square 
on it. So I'm going to assume that uh, the impact of that increases, the cost of that increases at an ever faster rate. As I get closer and closer to bankruptcy, as I make bankruptcy and bankruptcy more likely, those costs start becoming bigger and bigger and bigger. And this is just for the sake of an example. We're going to get into the economics of that um, at some point. So, but all I've done again using the APV principle is let me value the corporation before I figure this value created or destroyed by debt. But now I'm assuming that there is more destruction going on uh, for reasons again that we'll discuss in more details later. Okay, very good. So, exactly the same idea as before. Um, but now, of course, I have this offsetting uh, effect. Of that, and so then what happens is that yes, initially that is all good um, uh, because it gives me this interest tax yield, but eventually this D square is going to catch up with me and it's going to start destroying value. So, for instance, if now I plot value of my corporation with bankrupt bankruptcy cost, it's going to look like so. And this is a picture with which we're going to become very, very familiar. This is the picture that underlies the so-called trade-off theory of optimal capital structure, which is initially that is all good in part because it, I mean, mostly because it saves me taxes, but there are other reasons that we'll discuss uh, soon as well. But eventually that becomes a problem because bankruptcy becomes a more and more likely Possibility, which is going to have both direct costs, more lawyers, and uh, indirect costs, bad behavior on the part of my manager. And then, so here, for instance, I could ask myself, what is the optimal capital structure? What is the optimal quantity of debt? And of course, I would look uh, over here for the peak of um, this uh, curve, which I could use calculus and look for the part where. Um, this derivative here is equal to zero, but of course here we can just look it up. And if we look it up, we can see that the peak is right here. So this is approximately the right quantity of debt. We could also do this exactly uh, since we're in Excel by using, uh, for instance, the solver, which I do not have here. So I'm going to bring back by going to my add-ins. and going to my Excel add-in and I want to add the solver. Thank you, there we go. Oh, preparing to install. This is awkward. Okay, never mind. I'm going to cancel this and I'll let you figure this out uh, on your own or rather in video number six, we'll do this first. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to just uh, ask Excel to tell me what is the quantity of debt that makes this number here the highest. Okay, very good. And now I've screwed up my Excel entirely. This is not uh, very good. This makes for compelling video right there. So let me try to kill it some other way. I'm going to use my task manager. This is fun stuff I'm showing you. And Microsoft Excel, I'm going to kill my Excel and I'm going to bring it back up, hopefully. All right, let me bring some Excel back up. It's very good movie making here. I want to disable it, yes, you bet. Okay. Very good. So this is most of what I wanted to tell you today. But uh, with the few minutes remaining here, I'm going to do maybe a little bit more. So let me open uh, what we had just now. And of course, I did not save anything, uh, unfortunately. So what do I want to do next? So we've talked about taxes here at this point. And so let's take stock in what we've done. One of the things that we've done is we've discovered that WAC is exactly right, is exactly the right discount rate. And we will talk about um, other advantages of WAC. Well, actually, let me do this today in this very disorganized video. 
Modigliani and Miller gives you a justification for using WAC in practice, a theoretical justification, which is that WAC is exactly the right discount rate for unlevered FCFS in Modigliani and Miller. That's one advantage. The other one is WAC is intuitive. What do I mean by this? When we say that a project ha has a positive NPV at WAC, what we are saying is that in expectation terms, the project is generating enough cash flows to meet the expectations of uh, all my various stakeholders. Well, that seems like a good, solid, intuitive way to live your life. If as a corporation, I'm only going to invest in projects which in expected terms deliver on those expectations, that seems good. Okay, so that's the plus of WAC. And by the way, this is uh, compared to other discount rates that people dis uh, use in practice, that's, our, that's pretty good. I mean, WAC is on strong footing right there because I can say two things about those discount rates that I cannot say about most of the discount rates that I see used in practice. But the problem with WAC is that it relies on heroic assumptions. And here I'm listing two, but I could go on and on and on. First of all, you have to buy the entire Modigliani Miller and stru Modigliani structure, which has a lot of assumptions. One is that the capital structure is fixed over time, which we know not to be the case in practice. Two is that this idea that discount rates, the um, risk expectations of uh, or the risk premium that investors require is independent of time. I'm using the same discount rate for cash flows coming from very different periods. But we know that's not true. When you take a fixed income course, you're going to spend 90% of your time understanding the term structure of risk premia and understanding that people have different risk preferences for different time periods. And of course, WAC cannot possibly do this because we're using one discount rate for all my cash flows. Okay, very good. So what do we do then when we are in a situation where for sure WAC fails miserably? For instance, let's assume that we're in a situation where capital structure is not fixed. Well, then you have to go to what always works, which is the adjusted present value principle, which tells you, look, if you're in a situation where Modigliani Miller, relying on Modigliani and Miller's world is completely out of the question, then, Take two steps. One is value the corporation as if it was unlevered. And two, be very careful about the, the value created and destroyed by that. Measure that independently and then add that to the value of the unlevered corporation. So let me uh, do this in, a, in the case of a specific example. So let's go back to our numbers, um, which we created and I'm just going to copy exactly the same structure. So I'm going to make a copy of the same assumptions and I'm going to bring them to a different tab. Very good. And I'm going to add like before a tax rate of 30% because now we have a tax rate of 30%, which means that the value of my unlevered corporation is not the one that I had a minute ago that I have above here. Instead, it is one minus the tax rate F4 times my expected EBIT F4 divided by the unlevered return. So we did this this morning. So this is the value. And now I'm going to assume that I have some specific amount of debt. Uh, let me make it up. Let's say uh, 500. Okay, very good. But now instead of putting myself in the world of Modigliani and Miller, I'm going to assume that this is debt, which is going to be repaid over 10 years. Why not? And it's going to be fully amortized and it's going to have fixed payment over 10 years. So we're no longer in Modigliani and Miller. It is no longer an, um, uh, an infinitely lift perpetuity, which means that the capital structure is going to be very, very different in time. I'm going to, for instance, start with some debt initially, and I'm going to go to a capital structure of zero debt after 10 years, for instance. So Modigliani Miller is completely wrong. Yet, I can pretend that uh, I am in the world of Modigliani and Miller, which is discount unlevered FCFF at WAC. And we know that that's going to give me a value of 500 plus 30% um, of the quantity of debt. This is 
the Modigliani and Miller. So let me make sure because this is not the value I have on my note. So this is, let me do this again. So this number here, the Modigliani Miller uh, number is going to be not 500. Of course, this is the mistake I made. It's the value of the unlevered corporation plus tax rate 30 percent times 500. Now we have the correct formula. And this is what Modigliani and Miller tells me. Uh, this corporation would be worth $733 million if it maintained its capital structure forever. But of course, it doesn't. And let's see exactly how much the capital structure is going to change. So I'm going to pay that over 10 years. So one, two, three, all the way to 10. What is my debt value going to be? Well, all I know is that my debt value at the beginning of year one is going to be 500, which as usual is going to enable me to compute my interest, which is always quantity of debt at the start of the year times the interest rate required on that debt. And then I'm going to have a payment on that debt, that payment I said is going to be fixed, which means I get to use for once Excel's payment formula. The rate is 8%. There's going to be 10 periods over which I repay my debt. And I need this annoying minus before the quantity of debt which I'm trying to repay. That's the payment that I need. What? How much debt am I left with at the beginning of year two? It is debt plus interest minus payment. That's the standard formula. Then I lower my interest down. The payment is going to be the same. It is constant um, in this case. Click, click. And then let me make sure that everything amortizes. I start the last period with owing $69 plus about $5 uh, in interest. To repay all of that and be done, I need to make a payment of 74, so it all adds up. This is fully amortizing. I've done my uh, calculations correctly. But here you can see that the capital structure is anything but constant, right? I start with quite a bit of debt, 500, and then by year 11, my debt has become zero. So imagine I'm doing DCF at this point, and I'm asking myself, should I use WAC? And if I wanted to use WAC, I would say, which debt to equity ratio or which debt to value ratio should I use? The one very positive one that I have initially or zero, which I have eventually something in the middle. So you would not even know where to um, begin. But if you used the initial quantity of debt, we know this, we've done the math this morning. Modigliani and Miller would tell you that the value of the corporation is 733 million. So let's see um, how much, uh, how, how wrong that is. So we're going to calculate value using the adjusted present value principle, which again, that is always correct. So what is the value using the adjusted uh, present value principle? The, this is always a two-step process. I start with the value of the unlevered corporation, and then I calculate the NPV created by financing. So what is the NPV created by financing? So here, the NPV created by financing, I have nothing else. I have not said anything about bankruptcy or anything like that, is the tax break that I'm going to get from all those interest deductions here. So let me calculate the present value of those interest deduction. So the right discount rate for um, the interest deduction is 8%. Uh, it, that is a bit of a, an assumption here, but it's going to be approximately correct. Why is it an assumption? Because 8% is the discount rate that I apply to my debt payments. It is no longer the case that the interest portion of my uh, payment is proportional to payments. So making that argument that RD is the right discount rate for the interest tax yield is already shaky, but it's not clear what else to use. So we're going to use it as uh, probably the best thing we can do here. So we're going to discount my interest deduction at 
8%. But of course, this is so far just the present value of the interest deduction. What I get to save is 30% of that. That's my tax deduction. So I'm going to multiply this by 30%. So again, this here is the value of the unlevered corporation. The rest of the formula here is the NPV created by debt. In other words, the present value of the interest tax shield. And now this is the true value of the corporation using an APV approach as long as we believe that 8% discount rate, which like I said, is going to be good enough for our uh, purposes for today. For instance, if you believe that debt is risk-free, then most certainly the interest tax yield is risk-free and therefore the interest rate required from that debt is also the interest that you would require from the interest tax yield for one justification. Um, anyway, 8% is what we're going to use. And that value, which should not be a percent, it should just be a number. So format, come on. I'm going to format it as a number. There we go. And I'm going to give myself a few decimal. So the true value, as long as 8% is right, which here it probably is, is about $637 million. That's a hundred million difference. If I had gone, if I had used WAC, um, using the initial capital structure to discount my unlevered FCFF, I would get this number. Here, using APV, I get that number. That's a hundred million difference. And in particular, uh, the value, the true value is much, much lower. Why? Because I'm assuming an interest deduction basically of 40 forever. Instead, I'm getting an interest de deduction which is much less than 40. And in fact, after 11 years, it becomes zero. So I'm overstating the present value of the interest tax yield. So that means that I'm going to call some projects positive NPV when in fact they are negative NPV because I am making the wrong assumption that capital structure structure is constant when in fact leverage is declining over time. Okay, so the bottom line here is in situations where constant capital structure does not make any sense, you need to use the APV principle, unfortunately, because uh, that gets um, longer. And this is all I wanted to tell you in this video. So I'm going to stop it right now.